Hey folks, <laughs> sorry I had some technical difficulties there with the camera, but it looks like we are all set now. Uh, welcome back to our classic tales reading of Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. I am your narrator, Libba Beecham, Director of Media and Communications here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. So this is part three, and um, when we last left off, Joe and her neighbor Lori, um, a young boy who uh, she knew was her neighbor, or a young, a young man, he's, he's 15, I believe we just learned. And um, they had had conversations before, we recall that they had met at a party recently, and they know that they're neighbors, and Joe seems to be uh, making the effort to be more neighborly, so <laughs> they have uh, met for conversation, and uh, we're learning a bit more about Laurie and why he's cooped up all the time. And it seems that Joe might be able to sort of uh, bring him out of his shell, so to speak, out of the house and be a bit more neighborly and friendly. So we are going to uh, start a little bit right before where we left off last time with Joe um, speaking. We are not strangers, we are neighbors, and you needn't think you'd be a bother. We want to know you, and I've been trying to do it this ever so long. We haven't been here a great while, you know, but we have got acquainted with all our neighbors but you. You see, Grandpa lives among his books and doesn't mind much what happens outside. Mr. Brooke, my tutor, doesn't stay here, you know, and I have no one to go about with me, so I just stop at home and get on as I can. That's bad. You ought to make an effort and go visiting everywhere you are asked. Then you'll have plenty of friends and pleasant places to go. Never mind being bashful. It won't last long if you keep going. 
Laurie turned red again, but wasn't offended at being accused of bashfulness, for there was so much goodwill in Joe, it was impossible not to take her blunt speeches as kindly as they were meant. "'Do you like your school?' asked the boy, changing the subject after a little pause, during which he stared at the fire and Joe looked about her, well pleased. "'Don't go to school. I'm a businessman. A uh, girl, I mean.' I go to wait on my great aunt, and a dear, cross old soul she is, too, answered Joe. Laurie opened his mouth to ask another question, but remembering just in time that it wasn't manners to make too many inquiries into people's affairs, he shut it again and looked uncomfortable. Joe liked his good breeding and didn't mind having a laugh at Aunt March, so she gave him a lively description of the fidgety old lady, her fat poodle, the parrot that talked Spanish, and the library where she reveled. Lori enjoyed that immensely, and when he told and when she told him about the prim old and when she told about the prim old gentleman who came once to woo Aunt March, and in the middle of a fine speech how Pole had tweaked his wig off to his great dismay, the boy lay back and laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks, and a maid popped her head in to see what was the matter. Oh, that does me no end of good. Tell on, please, he said, taking his face out of the sofa cushion, red and shining with merriment. Much elated with her success, Joe did tell on all about her plays and plans, their hopes and fears for father, and the most interesting events of the little world in which the sisters lived. Then they got to talking about books, and to Joe's delight, she found that Laurie loved them as well as she did, and had read even more than herself. "'If you like them so much, come down and see ours. Grandfather is out, so you needn't be afraid,' said Laurie, getting up. "'I'm not afraid of anything,' returned Joe with a toss of her head. "'I don't believe you are,' exclaimed the boy, looking at her with much admiration, though he privately thought she would have good reason to be a trifle afraid of the old gentleman if she met him in some of his moods. The atmosphere of the whole house being summer-like, Laurie led the way from room to room, letting Joe stop to examine whatever struck her fancy. And so, at last, they came to the library, where she clapped her hands and pranced as she always did when especially delighted. It was lined with books, and there were pictures and statues and distracting little cabinets full of coins and curiosities and sleepy hollow chairs and queer tables and bronzes and, best of all, a great open fireplace with quaint tiles all around it. "'What richness!' sighed Joe, sinking into the depth of a velour chair and gazing about her with an air of intense satisfaction. "'Theodore Lawrence, you ought to be the happiest boy in the world,' she added impressively. "'A fellow can't live on books,' said Laurie, shaking his head as he perched on a table opposite. Before he could say more, a bell rang, and Joe flew up, ex exclaiming with alarm, "'Mercy me, it's your grandpa!' "'Well, what if it is? You are not afraid of anything, you know,' returned the boy, looking wicked. "'I think I am a little bit afraid of him, but I don't know why I should be. Marmy said I might come, and I don't think you're any the worse for it,' said Jo, composing herself, though she kept her eye on the door. "'I'm a great deal better for it, and ever so much obliged.' I'm only afraid you are very tired of talking to me. It was so pleasant I couldn't bear to stop, said Laurie gratefully. The doctor to see you, sir, and the maid beckoned as she spoke. Would you mind if I left you for a minute? I suppose I must see him, said Laurie. Don't mind me, I'm happy as a cricket here, answered Joe. Laurie went away, and his guest amused herself in her own way. She was standing before a fine portrait of the old gentleman, with the door opened again, and without turning, she said decidedly, I'm sure now that I shouldn't be afraid of him, for he's got kind eyes, though his mouth is grim, and he looks as if he had a tremendous will of his own. He isn't as handsome as my grandfather, but I like him. <clears throat> "'Thank you, ma'am,' said a gruff voice behind her, and there, to her great dismay, stood old Mr. Lawrence. Poor Jo blushed till she couldn't blush any redder, and her heart began to beat uncomfortably fast as she thought what she had said. For a minute a wild desire to run away possessed her, but that was cowardly, and the girls would laugh at her, so she resolved to stay and get out of the scrape as she could.' 
A second look showed her that the living eyes under the bushy eyebrows were kinder even than the painted ones, and there was a sly twinkle in them, which lessened her fear a good deal. The gruff voice was gruffer than ever, as the old gentleman said abruptly, after the dreadful pause, "'So you're not afraid of me, hey?' "'Not much, sir.' And you, oh, let's see. And you don't think me as handsome as your grandfather? Not quite, sir. And I've got a tremendous will, have I? I only said I thought so. But you like me in spite of it. Yes, I do, sir. That answer pleased the old gentleman. He gave a short laugh, shook hands with her, and putting his finger under her chin, turned up her face, examined it gravely, and let it go, saying with a nod, You've got your grandfather's spirit, if you haven't, his face. He was a fine man, my dear, but what is better, he was a brave and honest one, and I was proud to be his friend. Thank you, sir. And Joe was quite comfortable after that, for it suited her exactly. What have you been doing to this boy of mine, eh? was the next question, sharply put. Only trying to be neighborly, sir. And Joe told how her visit came about. You think he needs cheering up a bit, do you? Yes, sir, he seems a little lonely, and young folks would do him good, perhaps. We are only girls, but we should be glad to help if we could, for we don't forget the splendid Christmas present you sent us, said Joe eagerly. Tut, 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 that was the boy's affair. How is the poor woman? Doing nicely, sir. And off went Joe, talking very fast, as she told all about the Hummels, in whom her mother had interested richer friends than they were. "'Just her father's way of doing good. "'I shall come and see your mother some fine day. "'Tell her so. "'There's a tea bell. "'We have it early on the boy's account. "'Come down and go on being neighborly. "'If you'd like to have me, sir. "'Shouldn't ask you if I didn't.' "'And Mr. Lawrence offered her his arm "'with old-fashioned courtesy. "'What would Meg say to this?' "'thought Joe as she marched away "'while her eyes danced with fun "'as she imagined herself telling the story at home.' "'Hey, why, what the dickens has come to the fellow?' said the old gentleman as Laurie came running downstairs and brought up with a start of surprise at the astounding sight of Joe arm in arm with his redoubtable fa grandfather. "'I didn't know you'd come, sir,' he began as Joe gave him a triumphant little glance. "'That's evident by the way you racket downstairs. Come to your tea, sir, and behave like a gentleman.' And having pulled the boy's hair by way of a caress, Mr. Lawrence walked on, while Laurie went through a series of comic evolutions behind their back, which nearly produced an explosion of laughter from Joe. The old gentleman did not say much as he drank his four cups of tea, but he watched the young people, who soon chatted away like old friends, and the change in his grandson did not escape him. There was color, light, and life in the boy's face now, vivacity in his manner, and genuine merriment in his laugh. She's right, the lad is lonely. I'll see what these little girls can do for him, thought Mr. Lawrence as he looked and listened. He liked Joe, for her odd, blunt ways suited him, and she seemed to understand the boy almost as well as if she had been one herself. If the Lawrences had been what Joe called prim and pokey, she would not have got on at all, for such people always made her shy and awkward. But finding them free and easy, she was so herself and made a good impression. When they rose, she proposed to go, but Laurie said he had something more to show her, and took her away to the conservatory, which had been lighted for her benefit. It seemed quite fairy-like to Joe as she went up and down the walks, enjoying the blooming walls on either side, the soft light, the damp, sweet air, and the wonderful vines and trees that hung about her, while her new friend cut the finest flowers till his hands were full. Then he tied them up, saying, with a happy look Joe liked to see, "'Please give these to your mother and tell her I like the medicine she sent me very much.'" They found Mr. Lawrence standing before the fire in the great drawing room, but Joe's attention was entirely absorbed by a grand piano which stood open. "'Do you play?' she asked, turning to Laurie with a respectful expression. "'Sometimes,' he answered modestly. "'Please do now. I want to hear it so I can tell Beth. Won't you first? Don't know how. Too stupid to learn, but I love music dearly.' So Laurie played, and Joe listened. 
with her nose luxuriously buried in her in heliotrope and tea roses. Her respect and regard for the Lawrence boy increased very much, for he played remarkably well and didn't put on any airs. She wished Beth could hear him, but she did not say so, only praised him till he was quite abashed and his grandfather came to the rescue. That will do, that will do, young lady. Too many sugar plums are not good for him. His music isn't bad, but I hope he will do as well in more important things. Going? Oh, well, I'm much obliged to you, and I hope you'll come again. My respects to your mother. Good night, Dr. Joe. He shook hands kindly, but looked as if something did not please him. When they got into the hall, Joe asked Laurie if she had done or said something amiss. He shook his head. No, it was me. He doesn't like to hear me play. Why not? I'll tell you some day. Uh, John is going home with you, as I can't. No need of that. I am not a young lady, and it's only a step. Take care of yourself, won't you? Yes, but you will come again, I hope, if you promise to come and see us after you are well. I will. Good night, Laurie. Good night, Joe. Good night. When all the afternoon's adventures had been told, the family felt inclined to go visiting in a body, for each found something very attractive in the big house on the other side of the hedge. Mrs. March wanted to talk of her father with the old man who had not forgotten him. Meg longed to walk in the conservatory. Beth sighed for the grand piano, and Amy was eager to see the fine pictures and statues. "'Mother, why didn't Mr. Lawrence like to have Laurie play?' asked Joe, who was of an inquiring disposition. "'I am not sure, but I think it was because his son, Laurie's father, married an Italian lady, a musician, which displeased the old man, who was very proud. The lady was good and lovely and accomplished, but he did not like her, and never saw his son after he married. They both died when Laurie was a little child, and then his grandfather took him home.' I fancy the boy, who was born in Italy, is not very strong, and the old man is afraid of losing him, which makes him so careful. Laurie comes naturally by his love of music, for he is like his mother, and I dare say his grandfather fears that he may want to be a musician. At any rate, his skill reminds him of the woman he did not like, and so he glowered, as Joe said. "'Dear me, how romantic!' exclaimed Meg. "'How silly!' said Joe. "'Let him be a musician if he wants to, "'and not plague his life out sending him to college when he hates to go. "'That's why he has such handsome black eyes and pretty manners, I suppose. "'Italians are always nice,' said Meg, who was a little sentimental. "'What do you know about his eyes and his manners? "'You never spoke to him hardly,' cried Joe, who was not sentimental.' "'I saw him at the party, and what you tell shows that he knows how to behave. "'That was a nice little speech about the medicine mother sent him. "'He meant the, the blanc mange, I suppose. "'How stupid you are, child. He meant you, of course. "'Did he?' and Joe opened her eyes as if it had never occurred to her before. "'I never saw such a girl. You don't know a compliment when you get it,' "'said Meg with the air of a young lady who knew all about the manor. I think they are great nonsense, and I'll thank you not to be silly and spoil my fun. Laurie's a nice boy, and I like him, and I won't have any sentimental stuff about compliments and such rubbish. We'll all be good to him, because he hasn't got any mother, and he may come over and see us, mayn't he, Marmy? Yes, Joe, your little friend is very welcome, and I hope Meg will remember that children should be children as long as they can. I don't call myself a child, and I'm not in my teens yet, observed Amy. "'What do you say, Beth?' "'I was thinking about our pilgrim's progress,' answered Beth, who had not heard a word. "'How we got out of the slough and through the wicket gate by resolving to be good, "'and up the steep hill by trying, and that maybe the house over there, full of splendid things, "'is going to be our palace beautiful.' "'We have got to get by the lions first, said Jo, as if she rather liked the prospect.' All right, still doing good. We are moving on to chapter six. Beth finds the palace beautiful. The big house did prove a palace beautiful, though it took some time for all to get in, and Beth found it very hard to pass the lions. Old Mr. Lawrence was the biggest one, but after he had called, said something funny or kind to each one of the girls, or talked over old times with their mother, nobody felt much afraid of him, except timid Beth. 
The other lion was the fact that they were poor and Lari rich, for this made them shy of accepting favors which they could not return. But after a while, they found that he considered them the benefactors and could not do enough to show how grateful he was for Mrs. March's motherly welcome, their cheerful society, and the comfort he took in that humble home of theirs. So they soon forgot their pride and interchanged kindnesses without stopping to think which was the greater. All sorts of pleasant things happened about that time, for the new friendship flourished like grass in spring. Everyone liked Lori, and he privately informed his tutor that the Marches were regularly splendid girls. With a delightful enthusiasm of youth, they took the solitary boy into their midst and made much of him, and he found something very charming in the innocent companionship of these simple-hearted girls. Never having known mother or sisters, he was quick to feel the influences they brought about him, and their busy, lively ways made him ashamed of the indolent life he led. He was tired of books, and found people so interesting now that Mr. Brooke was obliged to make very unsatisfactory reports, for Laurie was always playing truant and running over to the marches. "'Never mind. Let him take a holiday and make it up afterward,' said the old gentleman. "'The good lady next door says he is studying too hard and needs young society, amusement, and exercise. I suspect she is right, and that I've been coddling the fellow as if I had been his grandmother.' Let him do what he likes as long as he is happy. He can't get into mischief in that little nunnery over there, and Mrs. Marsh is doing more for him than we can. What good times they had, to be sure. Such plays and tableaux, such sleigh rides and skating frolics, such pleasant evenings in the old parlor, and now and then such gay little parties at the great house. Meg could walk in the conservatory whenever she liked and revel in bouquets. Joe browsed over the new library voraciously and convulsed the old gentleman with her criticisms. Amy copied pictures and enjoyed beauty to her heart's content, and Laurie played Lord of the Manor in the most delightful style. But Beth, though yearning for the grand piano, could not pluck up the courage to go to the Mansion of Bliss, as Meg called it. She went once with Joe, but the old gentleman, not being aware of her infirmity, infirmity, stared at her so hard from under his heavy eyebrows and said hey so loud that he frightened her so much her feet chattered on the floor she never told her mother, and she ran away, declaring that she would never go there any more, not even for the dear piano. No persuasions or enticements could overcome her fear till, the fact coming to Mr. Lawrence's ear in some mysterious way, he set about mending matters. During one of the brief calls he made, he artfully led the conversation to music and talked away about great singers whom he had seen, fine organs he had heard, and told such charming anecdotes that Beth found it impossible to stay in her distant corner, but crept nearer and nearer as if fascinated. At the back of his chair, she stopped and stood listening, with her great eyes wide open and her cheeks red with excitement of this unusual performance. Taking no more notice of her than if she had been a fly, Mr. Lawrence talked on about Laurie's lessons and teachers, and presently, as if the idea had just occurred to him, he said to Mrs. March, The boy neglects his music now, and I'm glad of it, for he was getting too fond of it. But the piano suffers for want of use. Wouldn't some of your girls like to run over and practice on it now and then, just to keep it in tune, you know, ma'am? Beth took a step forward and pressed her hands tightly together to keep from clapping them, for this was an irresistible temptation, and the thought of practicing on that splendid instrument quite took her breath away. Before Mrs. March could reply, Mr. Mr. Lawrence went on with an odd little nod and smile. They needn't see or speak to anyone, but run it at any time, for I'm shut up in my study at the other end of the house, Laurie is out a great deal, and the servants are never near the drawing room after nine o'clock. Here he rose, as if going, and Beth made up her mind to speak, for that last arrangement left, left nothing to be desired. Please tell the young ladies what I say, and if they don't care to come, why, never mind. Here a little hand slipped into his, and Beth looked up at him with a face full of gratitude as she said in her earnest yet timid way, Oh, sir, they do care very, very much. Are you the musical girl? he asked without any startling. Hey, as he looked down at her very kindly. 
I'm Beth. I love it dearly, and I'll come if you are quite sure nobody will hear me and be disturbed, she added, fearing to be rude, and trembling at her own boldness as she spoke. Oops, excuse me. I feel a sneeze coming on. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Our characters might have uh, the sniffles, sorry. <laughs> All right, let's continue. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. There we go. <laughs> Not a soul, my dear. The house is empty half the day, so come and drum away as much as you like, and I shall be obliged to you. How kind you are, sir. Beth blushed like a rose under the friendly look he wore, but she was not frightened now and gave the hand a grateful squeeze because she had no words to thank him for the precious gift he had given her. The old gentleman softly stroked the hair off her forehead and, stooping down, he kissed her, saying in a tone few people ever heard, I had a little girl once with eyes like these. God bless you, my dear. Good day, madam. And away he went in a great hurry. Beth had a rapture with her mother and then rushed up to impart the glorious news to her family of invalids as the girls were not home. How blithely she sang that evening and how they all laughed at her because she woke Amy in the night by playing the piano on her face in her sleep. Next day, having seen both the old and young gentlemen out of the house, Beth, after two or three retreats, fairly got in at the side door and made her way as noiselessly as any mouse to the drawing room where her idol stood. Quite by accident, of course, some pretty easy music lay on the piano, and with trembling fingers and frequent stops to listen and look about, Beth at last touched the great instrument and straightway forgot her fear, herself, and everything else but the unspeakable delight which the music gave her, for it was like the voice of a beloved friend. She stayed till Hannah came to take her home to dinner, but she had no appetite and could only sit and smile upon everyone in a general state of beatitude. After that, the little brown hood slipped through the hedge nearly every day, and the great drawing room was haunted by a tuneful spirit that came and went unseen. She never knew that Mr. Lawrence opened his study door to hear the old-fashioned airs he liked. She never saw Laurie mount guard in the hall to warn the servants away. She never suspected that the exercise books and new songs which she found in the rack were put there for her a special benefit. And when he talked to her about music at home, she only thought how kind he was to tell things that helped her so much. So she enjoyed herself heartily and found, what isn't always the case, that her granted wish was all she had hoped. Perhaps it was because she was so grateful for this blessing that a greater was given to her. At any rate, she deserved both. "'Mother, I'm going to work Mr. Lawrence a pair of slippers. "'He is so kind to me, I must thank him, and I don't know any other way. "'Can I do it?' asked Beth a few weeks after the eventful call of his. "'Yes, dear, it will please him very much, and be a nice way of thanking him. "'The girls will help you about them, and I will pay for the making up,' "'replied Mrs. March, who took peculiar pleasure in granting Beth's request "'because she so seldom asked anything for herself.' After many serious discussions with Meg and Joe, the pattern was chosen, the materials bought, and the slippers begun. A cluster of grave yet cheerful pansies on a deeper purple ground was pronounced very appropriate and pretty, and Beth worked away early and late with occasional lifts over hard parts. She was a nimble little needlewoman, and they were finished before anyone got tired of them. Then she wrote a short, simple note, and with Laurie's help, got them smuggled onto the study table one morning before the old gentleman was up. When this excitement was over, Beth waited to see what would happen. All day passed, and a part of the next day before any acknowledgement arrived, and she was beginning to fear she had offended her crotchety friend. On the afternoon of the second day, she went out to do an errand and give poor Joanna, the invalid doll, her daily exercise. As she came up the street, on her return, she saw three, uh, yes, four heads popping in and out of the parlor windows. And the moment they saw her, several hands were waved and several joyful voices screamed, Here's a letter from the old gentleman. Come quick and read it. Oh, Beth, he sent you, began Amy, gesticulating with unseemly energy. 
but she got no further, for Joe quenched her by slamming down the window. Beth hurried on in a flutter of suspense. At the door, her sister seized and bore her to the parlor in a triumphal procession, all pointing and all saying at once, Look there! Look there! Beth did look, and turned pale with delight and surprise, for there stood a little cabinet piano, with a letter lying on the glossy lid, directed like a signboard to Miss Elizabeth March. For me? gasped P- uh, gasped Beth, holding on to Joe and feeling as if she should tumble down. It was such an overwhelming thing altogether. Yes, all for you, my precious. Isn't it splendid of him? Don't you think he's the dearest old man in the world? Here's the key in the letter. We didn't open it, but we are dying to know what he says, cried Joe, hugging her sister and offering the note. You read it. I can't. I feel so queer. Oh, it is too lovely. And Beth hid her face in Joe's apron, quite upset by her present. Joe opened the paper and began to laugh, for the first words she saw were, Miss March, dear madam. How nice it sounds. I wish someone would write to me so, said Amy, who thought the old-fashioned address very elegant. I have had many pairs of slippers in my life, but I never had any that suited me so well as yours, continued Joe. Heart's ease is my favorite flower, and these will always remind me of the gentle giver. I like to pay my debts, so I know you will allow the old gentleman to send you something which once belonged to the little granddaughter he lost. With hearty thanks and best wishes, I remain your grateful friend and humble servant, James Lawrence. There, Beth, that's an honor to be proud of, I'm sure. Laurie told me how fond Mr. Lawrence used to be of the child who died, and how he kept all her little things carefully. Just think, he's given you her piano. That comes of having big blue eyes and loving music, said Joe, trying to soothe Beth, who trembled and looked more excited than she had ever before. See the cunning brackets to hold candles, and the nice green silk puckered up with a gold rose in the middle, and the pretty rack and stool all complete, added Meg, opening the instrument and displaying its beauties. Your humble servant, James Lawrence. Only think of his writing that to you. I'll tell the girls. They'll think it's splendid, said Amy, much impressed by the notes. Try it, honey. Let's hear the sound of the baby piano, said Hannah, who always took a share in the family joys and sorrows. So Beth tried it, and everyone pronounced it the most remarkable piano ever heard. It had evidently been newly tuned and put in apple pie order, but perfect as it was, I think the real charm lay in the happiest of all faces which leaned over it as Beth lovingly touched the beautiful black and white keys and pressed the bright petals. You'll, ha- You'll have to go and thank him, said Joe, by way of a joke, for the idea of the child's really going never entered her head. Yes, I mean to. I guess I'll go now before I get frightened thinking about it. And to the utter amazement of the assembled family, Beth walked deliberately down the garden, through the hedge, and in at the Lawrence's door. Well, I wish I may die if it ain't the queerest thing I ever see. The piano she turned her head. The piano has turned her head. She'd never have gone in her right mind, cried Hannah, staring after her, while the girls were rendered quite speechless by the miracle. They would have been still more amazed if they had seen what Beth did afterward. If you will believe me, she went and knocked at the study door before she gave herself time to think, and with a gruff voice called out, Come in, she did go in, right up to Mr. Lawrence, who looked quite taken aback, and held out her hand, saying, with only a small quaver in her voice, I came to thank you, sir, for... But she didn't finish, for he looked so friendly that she forgot her speech, and only remembering that he had lost the little girl he loved, she put both arms round his neck and kissed him. 
If the roof of the house had suddenly flown off, the old gen gentleman wouldn't have been more astonished. But he liked it. Oh dear, yes, he liked it amazingly, and was so touched and pleased by that confiding little kiss that all his crustiness vanished, and he just set her on his knee and laid his wrinkled cheek against her rosy one, feeling as if he got his own little granddaughter back again. Beth ceased to fear him from that moment and sat there talking to him as cozily as if she had known him all her life, for love casts out fear and gratitude can conquer pride. When she went home, he walked with her to her own gate, shook hands cordially, and touched his hat as he marched back again, looking very stately and erect, like a handsome, soldierly old gentleman as he was. When the girls saw that performance, Jo began to dance a jig by way of expressing her satisfaction. Amy nearly fell out of the window in her surprise, and Meg exclaimed with uplifted hands, Well, I do believe the world is coming to an end. <laughs> That's cute. Excuse my sniffles. All right, let's go on to uh, chapter seven, Amy's Valley of Humiliation. Oh, my. That boy is a perfect cyclops, isn't he? said Amy one day as Laurie clattered by on horseback with a flourish of his whip as he passed. How dare you say so when he's got both his eyes? And very handsome ones they are too, cried Jo, who resented any slighting remarks about her friend. I didn't say anything about his eyes, and I don't see why you need fire up when I admire his writing. Oh my goodness, that little goose means a centaur, and she called him a cyclops, exclaimed Joe with a burst of laughter. You needn't be so rude. It's, it's only a lapse of ling lingy, as Mr. Davis says, retorted Amy, finishing Joe with her Latin. I just wish I had a little of the money Lori spends on that horse, she added, as if to herself, yet hoping her sisters would hear. Why? asked Meg kindly, for Joe had gone off in another laugh at Amy's second blunder. I need it so much. I'm dreadfully in debt, and it won't be my turn to have the rag money for a month. In debt, Amy? <laughs> what do you mean? And Meg looks sober. Why, I owe at least a dozen pickled limes, and I can't pay them, you know, till I have money, for Marmy forbade my having anything charged at the shop. Tell me all about it. Are the limes the fashion now? It used to be pricking bits of rubber to make balls. And Meg tried to keep her countenance. Amy looked so grave and important. Why, you see, the girls are always buying them. And unless you want to be thought mean, you must do it too. It's nothing but limes now, for everyone is sucking them in their desks in school time and trading them off for pencils, bead rings, paper dolls, or something else at recess. If one girl likes another, she gives her a lime. If she's mad with her, she eats one before her face and doesn't offer even a suck. They treat by turns, and I've had ever so many, but haven't returned them, and I ought for they are debts of honor, you know. How much will pay them off and restore your credit? asked Meg, taking out her purse. A quarter would more than do it, and leave a few cents over for a treat for you. Uh, don't you like limes? Not much. You may have my share. Here's the money. Make it last as long as you can, for it isn't very plenty, you know. Oh, thank you. It must be so nice to have pocket money. I'll have a grand feast, for I haven't tasted a lime this week. I felt delicate about taking any, as I couldn't return them, and I'm actually suffering for one. Next day, Amy was rather late at school, but could not resist the temptation of displaying with pardonable pride a moist brown paper parcel before she consigned it to the inmost recesses of her desk. During the next few minutes, the rumor that Amy March had got 24 delicious limes, she ate one on the way, and was going to treat circulated uh, and was going to treat circulated through her set, and the attentions of her friends became quite overwhelming. Katie Brown invited her to her next party on the spot. Mary Kingsley insisted on lending her her watch till recess, and Jenny Snow, a satirical young lady who had uh, basely twitted Amy upon her limeless state, promptly buried the hatchet and offered to furnish answers to certain appalling sums. But Amy had not forgotten Miss Snow's cutting remarks about some persons whose noses were not too flat to smell other people's limes and stuck-up people who were not too proud to ask for them. 
and she inst instantly crushed that snow girl's hopes by the withering telegram. You needn't be so polite all, all of a sudden, for you won't get any. A distinguished personages, personage happened to visit the school that morning, and Amy's beautifully drawn maps received praise, which honor to her foe rankled in the, in the soul of Miss Snow and caused Miss March to assume the airs of a studious young peacock. But, alas, alas, pride goes before a fall, and the revengeful Snow turned the tables with disastrous success. No sooner had the guest paid the usual stale compliments and bowed himself out than Jenny, under pretense of asking an important question, informed Mr. Davis, the teacher, that Amy March had pickled limes in her desk. <laughs> now, Mr. Davis had declared limes a contraband article and solemnly vowed to publicly ferule the first person who was found breaking the law. This much-enduring man had succeeded in banishing chewing gum after a long and stormy war, had made a bonfire of the confiscated novels and newspapers, had suppressed a private post office, had forbidden distortions of the names, nicknames, and caricatures, and done all that one man could do to keep half a hundred rebellious girls in order. Boys are trying enough to human patience, goodness knows, but girls are infinitely more so, especially to nervous gentlemen with tyrannical tempers and no more talent for teaching than Dr. Blimber. Mr. Davis knew, knew any quantity of Greek, Latin, algebra, and ologies of all sorts, so he was called a fine teacher, and manners, morals, feelings, and examples were not considered any particular importance. He was a most unfortunate moment for denouncing Amy, and Jenny knew it. Mr. Davis had evidently taken his coffee too strong that morning. There was an east wind which always affected his neuralgia, and his pupils had not done him the credit which he felt he deserved. Therefore, to use the expressive, if not elegant, language of a schoolgirl, he was as nervous as a witch and as cross as a bear. The word limes was like fire to powder. His yellow face flushed, and he rapped on his desk with an energy which made Jenny skip to her seat with unusual rapidity. Young ladies, attention, if you please. At the stern order, the buzz ceased, and fifty pairs of blue, black, gray, and brown eyes were obediently fixed upon his awful countenance. Miss March, come to the desk. Amy rose to comply with outward composure, but a secret feel, fear oppressed her for the limes weighed upon her conscience. "'Bring with you the limes you have in your desk,' was the unexpected command which arrested her before she got out of her seat. "'Don't take all,' whispered her neighbor, a young lady of great presence of mind. Amy hastily shook out half a dozen and laid the rest down before Mr. Davis, feeling that any man possessing a human heart would relent when that delicious perfume met his nose." Unfortunately, Mr. Davis particularly detested the odor of the fashionable pickle, and disgust added to his wrath. "'Is that all? Not quite,' stammered Amy. "'Bring the rest immediately.' With a despairing glance at her set, she obeyed. "'You are sure there are no more?' "'I never lie, sir. So I see. Now take these disgusting things two by two and throw them out of the window.' There was a simultaneously si simultaneous sigh." which created quite a little gust as the last hope fled and the treat was ravished from their longing lips. Scarlet with shame and anger, Amy went to and fro twelve mortal times, and as each doomed couple, looking oh so plump and juicy, fell from her reluctant hands, a shout from the street completed the anguish of the girls, for it told them that their feast was being exalted over by the little Irish children who were their sworn foes. This, this was too much. All flashed indignant or appealing glances at the inexorable Davis, and one passionate lime lover burst into tears. As Amy returned from her last trip, Mr. Davis gave a pretentious hmm, and said in his most impressive manner, "'Young ladies, you remember what I said to you a week ago. I am sorry this has happened, but I never allow my rules to be infringed, and I never break my word. Miss March, hold out your hand.' Amy started and put both hands behind her, turning on him an imploring look which pleaded for her better than the words she could not utter. She was rather a favorite with old Davis, as of course he was called, 
And it's my private belief that he would have broken his word if the indignation of one irrepressible young lady had not found vent in a hiss. That hiss, faint as it was, irritated the irascible gentleman and sealed the culprit's fate. Your hand, Miss March, was the only answer her mute appeal received, and too proud to cry or beseech, Amy set her teeth, threw back her head defiantly, and bore without flinching several tingling blows on her little palm. They were neither many nor heavy, but that made no difference to her. For the first time in her life she had been struck, and the disgrace in her eyes was as deep as if he had knocked her down. "'You will now stand on the platform till recess,' said Mr. Davis, resolved to do the thing thoroughly since he had begun. That was dreadful. It would have been bad enough to go to her seat and see the pitying faces of her friends or the satisfied one of her few enemies, but to face the whole school with that shame fresh upon her seemed impossible, and for a second she felt as if she could only drop down where she stood and break her heart with crying.' A bitter sense of wrong, and the thought of Jenny Snow helped her to bear it, and taking the ig ignominious place, she fixed her eyes on the stove funnel about what now seemed a sea of faces, and stood there, so motionless and white that the girls found it hard to study with that pathetic figure before them. During the fifteen minutes that followed, the proud and sensitive little girl suffered a shame and pain which she never forgot. To others, it might seem a ludicrous or trivial affair, but to her it was a hard experience, for during the twelve years of her life she had, not, she had been governed by love alone, and a blow of that sort had never touched her before. The smart of her hand and the ache of her heart were forgotten in the sting of the thought, I shall have to tell at home, and they will be so disappointed in me. The fifteen minutes seemed an hour, but they came to an end at last, and the word recess had never seemed so welcome to her before. "'You can go, Miss March,' said Mr. Davis, looking as he felt uncomfortable. He did not soon forget the reproachful glance Amy gave him as she went, without a word to anyone, straight into the anteroom, snatched her things, and left the place forever, as she passionately declared to herself." She was in a sad state when she got home, and when the older girls arrived some time later, an indignation meeting was held at once. Mrs. March did not say much, but looked disturbed, and comforted her afflicted little daughter in the tenderest manner. Meg bathed the insulted hand with glycerine and tears. Beth felt that even her beloved kitties would fail as a balm for griefs like this. Joe wrathfully proposed that Mr. Davis be arrested without delay, and Hannah shook her fist at the villain and pounded potatoes for dinner as if she had him under her pestle. No notice was taken of Amy's flight except by her mates, but the sharp-eyed demoiselles discovered that Mr. Davis was quite benignant in the afternoon, also unusually nervous. Just before school closed, Joe appeared, wearing a grim expression as she stalked up to the desk and delivered a letter from her mother, then collected Amy's property and departed, carefully scraping the mud from her boots on the doormat as if she so shook the dust off the place of her feet. "'Yes, you can have a vacation from school, but I want you to study a little every day with Beth,' said Mrs. March that evening. "'I don't approve of corporal punishment, especially for girls. I dislike Mr. Davis's manner of teaching, and I don't think the girls you associate with are doing you any good, so I shall ask your father's advice before I send you anywhere else.' "'That's good. I wish all the girls would leave and spoil his old school. "'It's perfectly maddening to think of those lovely limes,' sighed Amy with the air of a martyr. "'I am not sorry you lost them, for you broke the rules and deserve some punishment for disobedience,' "'was the severe reply which rather disappointed the young lady, who expected nothing but sympathy. "'Do you mean you are glad I was disgraced before the whole school?' cried Amy." "'I should not have chosen that way of mending a fault,' replied her mother. "'But I'm not sure that it won't do you more good than a milder method. "'You are getting to be rather conceited, my dear, "'and it is quite time you set about correcting it. "'You have a good many little gifts and virtues, "'but there is no need of parading them, "'for conceit spoils the finest genius. "'There is not much danger that real talent or goodness "'will be overlooked long, even if it is. "'The consciousness of possessing and using it well should satisfy one, "'and the great charm of all power is modesty.' 
So it is, cried Laurie, who was playing chess in a corner with Joe. I knew a girl once who had a really remarkable talent for music, and she didn't know it, never guessed what sweet little things she composed when she was alone, and wouldn't have believed it if anyone had told her. I wish I'd known that nice girl. Maybe she would have helped me. I'm so stupid, said Beth, who stood beside him listening eagerly. You do know her, and she helps you better than anyone else could, answered Laurie, looking at her with such mischievous meaning in his merry black eyes that Beth suddenly turned very red and hid her face in the sofa cushion, quite overcome by such unexpected discovery. Joe let Laurie win the game to pay for that praise of her Beth, who could not be prevailed upon to play for them after her compliment. So Laurie did his best and sang delightfully, being in a particularly lively humor, for to the marches he seldom showed the moody side of his character. When he was gone, Amy, who had been pensive all evening, said suddenly, as if busy over some new idea, "'Is Laurie an accomplished boy?' Yes, he has had an excellent education and has much talent. He will make a fine man, if not spoiled by petting, replied her mother. And he isn't, and he isn't conceited, is he? asked Amy. Not in the least. That is why he is so charming and we all like him so much. I see. It's nice to have accomplishments and be elegant, but not to show off or get perked up, said Amy thoughtfully. These things are always seen and felt in a person's manner and conversations, if modesty used, but it is not necessary to display them, said Mrs. March, any more than it's proper to wear all your bonnets and gowns and ribbons at once, that folks may know you've got them, added Joe, and the lecture ended in a laugh. All right, we'll continue for the next uh, ten minutes into chapter eight. Joe meets Ap Apollyon. Let's see, Apollyon. Is there any definition? Let's see, Apollyon. A name for the devil, oh my. All right, let's see what this is all about. Girls, where are you going? Asked Amy, coming into their room one Saturday afternoon and finding them getting ready to go out with an air of secrecy, which excited her curiosity. Never mind, little girls shouldn't ask questions, replied Joe sharply. Now, if there is anything mortifying to our feelings when we are young, it is to be told that, and to be bidden to run away, dear, is still more trying to us. Amy bridled up at this insult, and determined to find out the secret if she teased for an hour. Turning to Meg, who never refused her anything very long, she said coaxingly, "'Do tell me. I think you might let me go, too, for Beth is fussing over her piano, and I haven't got anything to do, and I'm so lonely.' "'I can't, dear, because you aren't invited,' began Meg, but Joe broke in impatiently. "'Now, Meg, be quiet, or you will spoil it all. You can't go, Amy, so don't be a baby and whine about it.' "'You are going somewhere with Laurie, I know you are. "'You were whispering and laughing together on the sofa last night, "'and you stopped when I came in. "'Aren't you going with him?' "'Yes, we are. Now do be still and stop bothering.' "'Amy held her tongue but used her eyes "'and saw Meg slip a fan into her pocket. "'I know, I know you're going to the theater to see Seven Castles,' "'she cried, adding, adding resolutely. "'And I shall go, for Mother said I might see it, "'and I've got my rag money, "'and it was meant not to tell me in time.' "'Just listen to me a minute and be a good child,' said Meg soothingly. "'Mother doesn't wish you to go this week "'because your eyes are not well enough yet to bear the light of this fairy peace. "'Next week you can go with Beth and Hannah and have a nice time.' I don't like that half as well as going with you and Laurie. Please let me. I've been sick with this cold so long and shut up. I'm dying for some fun. Do, Meg. I'll be ever so good, pleaded Amy, looking as pathetic as she could. Suppose we take her. I don't believe Mother would mind if we bundle her up well, began Meg. If she goes, I shan't, and if I don't, Laurie won't like it, and it will be very rude after he invited only us to go and drag in Amy. "'I should think she'd hate to poke herself where she isn't wanted,' said Joe crossly, "'for she disliked the trouble of overseeing a fidgety child when she wanted to enjoy herself. "'Her tone and manner angered Amy, who began to put her boots on, saying in the most aggravating way, "'I shall go. Meg says I may, and if I pay for myself, Laurie hasn't anything to do with it.' 
you can't sit with us, for our seats are reserved, and you mustn't sit alone, so Laurie will give you his place, and that will spoil our pleasure. Or he'll get another seat for you, and it, that isn't proper. When you weren't asked, you shan't stir a step, so you may just stay where you are, scolded Joe, crosser than ever, having just pricked her finger in a hurry. Sitting on the floor with one boot on, Amy began to cry and Meg to reason with her when Laurie called from below and the two girls hurried down, leaving their sister wailing. For now, then she forgot. For now and then she forgot her grown-up ways and acted like a spoiled child. Just as the party was setting out, Amy called over the banister in a threatening tone. You'll be sorry for this, Joe March. See if you ain't. Fiddlesticks, returned Joe, slamming the door. They had a charming time, for the seven castles of the Diamond Lake was a brilliant and wonderful as heart could wish. But in spite of the comical red imps, sparkling elves, and the gorgeous princes and princesses, Joe's pleasure had a drop of bitterness in it. The fairy queen's yellow curls reminded her of Amy, and between the acts she amu amused herself with wondering what her sister would do to make her feel sorry for it. She and Amy had had many lively skirmishes in the course of their lives, for both had quick tempers and were apt to be violent when fairly roused. Amy teased Joe, and Joe irritated Amy, and semi-occasional explosions occurred, of which both were much ashamed afterward. Although the oldest, Joe had the least self-control and had hard times trying to curb the fiery spirit which was continually getting her into trouble. Her anger never lasted long, and having humbly confessed her fault, she sincerely repented and tried to do better. Her sisters used to say that they rather liked to get Joe into a fury because she was such an angel afterward. Poor Joe tried desperately to be good, but her bosom enemy was always ready to flame up and defeat her, and it took years of patience, of patient effort to subdue it. When they got home, they found Amy reading in the parlor. She assumed an injured air as they came in, never lifted her eyes from her book or asked a single question. Perhaps curiosity might have conquered resentment if Beth had not been there to inquire and receive a glowing description of the play. On going up to put away her best hat, Joe's first look was toward the bureau, for in their last quarrel, Amy had soothed her feelings by turning Joe's top drawer upside down on the floor. Everything was in its place, however, and after a hasty glance into her various closets, bags, and boxes, Joe decided that Amy had forgotten and forgiven her uh, had forgiven and forgotten her wrongs. There, Joe was mistaken, for the next day she made a discovery which produced a tempest. Meg, Beth, and Amy were sitting together late in the afternoon when Joe burst into the room, looking excited and demanding breathlessly, "Has anyone taken my book?" Meg and Beth said no at once and looked surprised. Amy poked the fire and said nothing. Joe saw her color rise and was down upon her in a minute. Amy, you've got it. No, I haven't. You know where it is then. No, I don't. That's a fib, cried Joe, taking her by the shoulders and looking fierce enough to frighten a much braver child than Amy. It isn't. I haven't gotten, gotten it. Don't know where it is now and don't care. You know something about it, and you better tell it once or I'll make you. And Joe gave her a slight shake. Scold as much as you like. You'll never see your silly old book again, cried Amy, getting excited in her turn. Why not? I burned it up. What? My little book I was so fond of and worked over and meant to finish before father got home? Have you really burned it? said Joe, turning very pale, while her eyes kindled and her hands clutched Amy nervously. Yes, I did. I told you I'd make you pay for being so cross yesterday, and I have, so... Amy got no further, for Joe's hot temper mastered her, and she shook Amy till her teeth chattered in her head, crying in passion of grief and anger. You wicked, wicked girl! I never can write it again, and I'll never forgive you as long as I live! Meg flew to rescue Amy and, Be and Beth to pacify Joe, but Joe was quite beside herself, and with a parting box on her sister's ear, she rushed out of the room, up to the old sofa in the garret, and finished her fight alone. The storm cleared up below, for Mrs. March came home, and, having heard the story, soon brought Amy to a sense of the wrong she had done her sister. Joe's book was the pride of her heart, and was regarded by her family as a literary sprout of great promise— 
It was only half a dozen little fairy tales, but Jo had worked over them patiently, putting her whole heart into her work, hoping to make something good enough to print. She had just copied them with great care and had destroyed the old manuscript so that Amy's bonfire had consumed the loving work of several years. It seemed a small loss to others, but to Jo it was a dreadful calamity, and she felt that it could never be made up to her. Beth mourned as for a departed kitten, and Meg refused to defend her pet. Mrs. March looked grave and grieved, and Amy felt that no one would love her till she had part asked for pardon for the act which she now regretted more than any of them. When the tea bell rang, Joe appeared, looking so grim and unapproachable that it took all Amy's courage to say meekly, "'Please forgive me, Joe. I'm very, very sorry.' "'I never shall forgive you,' was Joe's stern answer, and from that moment she ignored Amy entirely. No one spoke of the great trouble, not even Mrs. March, for all had learned by experience that when Joe was in that mood, words were, not, words were wasted.' and the wisest course was to wait till some little accident or her own generous nature softened Joe's resentment and healed the breach. It was not a happy evening, for though they sewed as usual, while their mother read aloud from Bremer, Scott, and Edgeworth, something was wanting, and the sweet home peace was disturbed. They felt this most when singing time came, for Beth could only play. Joe stood dumb as a stone, and Amy broke down, so Meg and mother sang alone. But in spite of their efforts to be as cheery as larks, the flute-like voices did not seem to chord as well as usual, and all felt out of tune. As Jo received her goodnight kiss, Mrs. March whispered gently, "'My dear, don't let the sun go down upon your anger. Forgive each other, help each other, and begin again tomorrow.'" I think we will end there for today as our hour is up. Um, I... I do want uh, to continue to see how Joe and Amy will mend their relationship. And uh, perhaps Amy has already learned her lesson, but <laughs> perhaps uh, there's, there's some way to mend this. So we will learn uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow's broadcast is going to be a pre-recorded video um, due to our schedule this week. And we'll probably have some more pre-recorded videos uh, next week, but they'll be posted every day at noon, same time, uh, noon Eastern time. And I do hope that you will join us for uh, today's live stream at 2 p.m. Eastern. Historian Glenn Kyle is going to take your questions from the chat about all things history. It is our series of uh, Ask a Historian. And uh, those are always really fun. So think about those history questions you have for Glenn. Join us at 2. And uh, we hope to see you then. And uh, if not, we'll see you tomorrow. And thanks for joining us. <laughs>